Good morning, everyone. So my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We're really, really excited because we are we have a great speaker back today for the second time. Uh, but before I introduce her, I want to go through our group of five classes that are joining us from across North America and give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We have uh, Miss McLaughlin's uh, grade sixes in St. Catharines, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hi. We've got Mr. We've got Harriet Todd Public School, five sixes in Aurelia, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hi. We've got Miss Burns, uh, grade sevens in Milton, Ontario. Got a lot of Ontario. Hi. Awesome. I we've love got, that it's getting louder as they go. I know. <laughs> Don't get the excitement. Uh, we've got Mr. England's grade fives in Farmington, Missouri. Hi, guys. They're muted, but they're there. We believe in it. Uh, and then we've got Mr. Vino's grade nines in Virginia Beach in Virginia. Hi, guys. Hi! A little lower <laughs> pitch there, but the older kids, I love it. Okay. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for a speaker. So we are joined live in the labs in the underbelly of the Natural History Museum in London by Dr. Gerdiva Amon. She's a Trinidadian deep sea biologist who studies the amazing and wonderful creatures in the deep sea, the most unexplored and largest habitat in the world, and how humans affect those creatures. So I'm not going to spoil it any more than that, other than to say her work has been featured all over the world, BBC, CNN, National <laughs> Geographic, and more. Uh, and we are so happy to have her back. Thank you so, so much for joining us, Diva. Thank you so much, Jesse. And I'm so excited to be here to tell you guys about the deep sea because the deep sea is awesome. Um, so before I begin with my presentation, I just wanted to kind of gauge how much you guys knew about the deep sea. So we're going to do a little kind of pop quiz quickly. Um, you're just going to have to shout out, Jesse, you're going to have to help. Um, so who can tell me four things, no, let's say five things about the deep sea, like okay, just start. about what it's like. We will start with Miss uh, Trevino's class. So if you guys, anything about the deep sea? <laughs> what was that? Dark. 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 Okay, I heard dark. That's good. So once you go past 400 meters, there is no light in the deep sea. So yes, that's correct. That's one. Yeah. Anybody we'll else? McLaughlin's class. Anything about the deep sea? What do you guys think? There's high pressure down there. Exactly. So yes, that's number two. So once you go every 10 meters, you go down in the deep sea, then you get one atmosphere of pressure, what we're feeling now. So if you go down three kilometers in the deep sea, then that equals 300 times the pressure we're feeling now. And things get crushed really, really small if, not, if they don't belong down there. So that's two. Okay, Mr. Bernie, Mr. Bernie's group, or Harry and Todd. See, yep. Yeah. Lots of hounds. The Mariner Trench is the deepest part of the ocean. That is, that is correct. Yes, there are lots of different habitats, which I'm going to tell you about soon. But that is not one of the five things I was looking for. I'm thinking, like, if you were to go down there, what would it actually be like? It's cold. It's dark. Well, I just said one of them. Whoops. Okay, and they're high, very high pressures. So it's really, really cold. Temperatures tend to be about freezing, just above freezing. So really, really cold, a place that we wouldn't like to live. So the last two are the really hard ones. Any more guesses? What do we okay. think there's a lot of food down in the deep sea or not a lot of food? Ms. Burns, what do you think? A lot of food? Not a lot. Not a lot. Not a lot. So whoever said not a lot, that's correct. So most of the food in the deep sea comes actually from the surface. Because there's no light down in the deep ocean, that means there's no plants. And so most of the food comes from dead plankton, dead animals, dead fish, and so on, that have to float all the way down, sink all the way down, sorry, into the deep sea. And that means there really isn't a lot. And what's the last thing? Okay, well, we can- How much Mr. do we know about the deep sea? Mr. England's class, if you guys want to demute your mics, do you have any thoughts? Do we know a lot about the deep sea? Do we know a little? Any other class wants to join in? We don't know that. No, I'm exactly. 
So because the deep sea is such a difficult place to go, like we can't go there, you know, we would get crushed, we would not be able to breathe. It's just a really, really difficult place to live and to work. It means that we don't really know that much about the deep sea. It's really hard for us scientists to do work there because the pieces of equipment we use, as I'll tell you a little bit about in a second, are so expensive and so high tech. So it means that, yeah, we don't know a lot. So dark, cold, little food, poorly explored and high pressures. Those are the main sort of things about the deep sea. So you guys did great. So with that, let me try and jig to get my to get my presentation up. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yep, we're perfect. Oh, nope, that is totally not what I want to do. Bear with me, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, can you see? Right, okay, bye. <laughs> Technology, not my strong suit. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the deep sea today. Um, why it's a really interesting place and why we should be doing more work there. Um, so as I said, my name is Diva, Diva Amon, and I'm currently a research fellow at the Natural History Museum in London in the UK. Um, but I'm actually from the Caribbean, um, which, yeah, I do miss a lot. But being in, the, being in London at the Natural History Museum means I get to do a lot of really cool research and I'm really excited to be here. So... Moving quickly along, so that's where I'm from, Trinidad and Tobago, and it's, you know, they're very pretty beaches, beautiful coral reefs, and because I grew up there, it meant a lot of, I spent a lot of time, you know, at the beach, in the ocean, on the ocean, just generally outdoors, and so it meant that I kind of was surrounded by the ocean and had a lot of questions about, you know, that what, what lives in the ocean and, and things that I couldn't answer, and so... When I went to university, I decided to study marine biology, which means, you know, what lives in our oceans. And um, just a few years after doing that, I took a class where my teacher said that, you know, the deep sea is really, really unexplored. In fact, like less than 1% of the deep sea has been explored. And it kind of really sort of hit home that as a deep sea scientist, I could be like a real life explorer. I mean, when, you know, you all, we all want to be sort of like Indiana Jones or, you know, some kind of cool explorer. And here was the chance to really do that. And I will say that I absolutely love what I do. You know, in the deep sea, there are so many things that we don't know. And on nearly every single expedition that I've been on, you know, I've been on about 15 or 16 of them we find something that no one has ever seen before, whether that's a new species of animal or a new habitat that we had no idea existed. And that's really, really special to be, you know, among the first people on the planet to see something. So in my work, I tend to do a couple cool, use a couple cool tools, like uh, the upper left photo is in a submersible. And so those are the ones where you can actually go down into the deep sea, which is the craziest, coolest thing, I must say. And then in the left um, lower corner, you'll see another picture of this later on. This is in the control van. So what, we go out on ships for like one to three months every year. And because the deep sea can be so far away from land, it means that we spend quite a lot of time out there. Um, so sometimes we'll be out at sea for like a month and never see land, which is pretty special. Um, and when we're out there, we have these places called control vans, which are kind of like dark rooms where we're able to control the equipment that we're sending down into the deep sea. Um, and so I'll show you a picture in a little while of some of that equipment that we send down that we do not go in. Um, which is what we tend to use more often, these sort of robots. Um, and here you can see me standing next to one of the robots. You can actually see, you can see my, this is the manipulator here, which is the arm of the robot, which we use to pick up rocks and samples and so on. And this, I'm holding a piece of coral that we just collected from the deep sea. And um, that may be a new species. So that was really exciting. So my research concentrates on trying to answer two sort of two basic questions. You know, what lives in our world's deep ocean? Because as I just said, we know so little about it that we can't even answer that super basic question. 
And secondly, how are we humans impacting it? You may think that the deep sea is this really far away place, um, but you know it's not that far away. We are still having a negative impact on it, um, whether that is you know plastics ending up in our deep sea, or climate change, or um, the multiple ways in which we use our deep ocean. And so I study the really big, fun animals, things you don't have to use a microscope to see, you know, things. Of what I do. So what exactly is the deep ocean? Well, um, it's everything that's blue on this map. And so you can see that's actually quite a lot of the planet. In fact, that's about 60% or 65%, I think, of our ocean surface. This is by far the largest ecosystem on Earth. And yet, a lot of us don't really realize that, right? And as I said, most of the deep sea is actually completely unexplored. Only about 1% of it have we actually seen what's down there. We have better maps of the moon, of Mars, of Venus, than we do our own deep sea floor. And that's crazy, that's staggering. So if we went down into the deep sea right now, picked a place, what would it look like? Well, most of it would look like this. So this is an image taken in the North Atlantic Ocean. And this is about four kilometers depth, which is about uh, two and a half miles or so. And it looks kind of boring, right? I mean, it's a flat plain. There's a lot of sediment. We can see, you know, this is a sea urchin here. This is a worm, a sponge. But there's not really that much life going on. But that's actually because a lot of life is in ooh, is in the sediment. Um, and as I said, you know, it's also a really, really difficult place to live. So because there's a limited amount of food that goes around in most of the deep sea, it means that a lot of the animals are sometimes quite small. So, um, but just like on land, there are a huge variety of different types of habitats. So we have things like seamounts, which are mountains underneath the sea. And those can have huge, beautiful coral gardens on them. I mean, the most colorful, stunningly beautiful corals you've ever seen. And, you know, most of us tend to think that corals are, you know, found mostly in tropical waters where you can go snorkeling and see them where it's hot. But no, actually, most of the corals on the planet are found down in the deep sea, interestingly. And some of them can get to really big sizes. Some of them can get to really, really old ages. In fact, a couple of years ago, they found that some of these corals live to over 4,000 years old, okay? That's crazy amounts of time, you know? That's like when the wheel was invented, which is just insane. Then we also have things like hydrothermal vents. Now, these are um, these sort of volcano type environments, except instead of gushing lava, they gush black superheated fluid, which you can see sort of here. And because they have this really interesting fluid, this black fluid that they tend to gush, that fluid has lots of chemicals in it. And it turns out that some animals in the deep sea, a very few amount, can actually use those chemicals. So they have bacteria within their bodies that then use the chemicals to make food for those animals. So we have things like these are barnacles growing on the growing on the chimneys of these volcanoes. Then we've also got kiwa crabs, which I'll tell you a little bit about, or yeti crabs, which I'll tell you a little bit about in the future. And I actually have one of those sitting next to me in the lab, so remind me to show you that. And we've also got things like anemones and shrimp down in this lower photo. And these these environments really, because of that, because this is one of the few places in the deep sea where there is a lot of food, it means that you get really, really like luxurious, you know, abundant lots and lots of life just all in one little tiny place and it makes for the most amazing pictures and you know video as you can see and then we have things like you know food falls so that's when as i said most of the food comes from the sea surface most of it is in the form of plankton
out in the ocean and over time slowly sinks into the deep sea. And then you'll have things like whales. You know, what happens to whales when they die? Food? Have you ever thought of that? Sometimes they end up on beaches where we can see them beached. But actually, most of the time, they sink down into the deep sea. And because there isn't a lot of food in the deep sea, you end up with this sort of feeding bonanza. It's like it's Thanksgiving and, you know, all of the families from far and wide come around to see and eat this food, which has just arrived on the sea floor. So you can see the top right hand photo is a whale that would have just arrived on the sea floor. You can see a lot of the flesh is still there, but then you can see there are these hagfish, which are a type of sort of eel like animal, just eating all of that flesh. And then you can see the top left and bottom right photos are where the flesh is actually gone because it's been all eaten. And you can see the spinal cord of, or the vertebral column, sorry, of the whale left as well as the ribs. And then an entirely different set of fauna, much smaller animals will move in to pick off any bits of food left and so on. And then the lower left, we've got a piece of wood, which again, a whole different set of animals will move in to eat that wood, whether it's lobsters you can see or shrimp, or actually there are little clams that can burrow into the wood and eat it. It just means that in the deep sea, because food is so limited, every little bit of it tends to be used. And then there are things like trenches, there are things like canyons, there are plains, there are brine pools, there are seeps. I mean, you name it, there's, once they have something similar on land, they tend to have it in the deep sea. Things like, we even have these sort of river lakes of super, super salty water, which it does look just like a lake at the bottom of the ocean. And that's, again, crazy considering, you know, it's like water in water. So... Well, how do we study these incredible habitats? Well, um, as I was mentioning before, we tend to use either submersibles, which are the ones we can go in, which you'll see in a second, or robots. So these are called remotely operated vehicles, and that means that we don't go in them. They're attached to the ship. We send them overboard. This is one about to go over. Um, they're about the size of a car, and um, they have all kinds of really cool technology. So here you can see they've got loads of lights. I mean, loads and loads and loads of lights. They've got two different arms here to be used to pick up rocks, to pick up animals, to pick up experiments. Then they've got this tray on the front of it where we can put those samples we collect or we can put things in so that we want to drop off in the deep sea, like experiments. And then we have a whole bunch of different cameras as well on this, on this ROV. And this piece of equipment is what we tend to use the most in our deep sea work. And it's essentially our eyes, our ears, and our hands on the deep sea floor because we can't really go there. And as I said, we also use ships and submersibles. So this is an example of one of the submersibles that I've worked with before. Um, and so, this was in the Antarctic, um, and you can see here the ship. We tend to use these types of very large vessels that can go out to sea for, you know, between one and three months a year. And then they tend to have these um, submersibles that can be launched off the back and then can actually take people down to the deep sea. And as I said, that's one of the most amazing experiences I think possibly anybody could have. Um, but it, these ships can usually hold about 50 to 60 people. Um, we have everything from cooks to someone who drives the ship's captains to engineers who keep the ship working to people who pilot the ROVs or the submersibles and, of course, scientists as well. So it really is like this little working, working neighborhood. So why is the deep sea important? Why should we care about this really remote place that we may never get the chance to go to? I mean, yeah, why, why, why should we care? Well, as I said, it's the largest ecosystem on our planet. Um, as we mentioned, about 96% of all habitable space on Earth. And that really big size comes with a lot of responsibility. So the, the deep sea actually performs, has or provides, sorry, ecosystem services that keep our planet healthy and keep us alive. So it does things like cycle nutrients, which we need. It removes carbon dioxide from our atmosphere, helping to counteract um, climate change. Um, it detoxifies our oceans. Um, and then more and more and more, our deep sea is being used for crucial resources, which we need. So for instance, a lot of fish that we eat nowadays comes from the deep ocean. So we get food from the deep sea. Also things like oil and gas. 
Um, things like metals in the future, we might be getting those from the deep ocean. And then also, you know, so it hasn't happened yet, but perhaps medicine in the future might come from the deep sea or other sort of genetic material. And actually, there's also things like, you know, things in the deep sea give us inspiration in multiple ways. So there was there's this deep sea sponge, it's called a glass sponge, and it has the most intricate structure. And actually, that, that sponge was used as inspiration for creating more efficient fiber optic cables. So we've been using things in our deep sea to help us design things that will be more effective. And then also, you know, think about how many movies have been made about the deep sea, how many books have been written about deep sea. It's just is such an enigmatic place that it, that it really does, you know, inspire this curiosity in people, I think. And more and more, because we're using our deep sea more and more because of limited resources on land and in shallow waters, we are impacting our deep ocean. I've been on so many different expeditions and on every single one, we've seen trash in the deep sea. Um, this lower picture on the lower right is actually an expedition that I was on in December on a ship called the Oceanus Explorer. And they stream all of their um, expedition live. So you can actually see their deep sea exploration happening live. And they're gonna be um, diving later this, year, later this month in case you wanted to follow along with that in the Caribbean. And so we were looking for the shipwreck. We found this target and we thought when we were mapping that it would be a shipwreck. But in fact, we went down and it was a container, a shipping container that had been obviously lost at sea, probably during a hurricane or something. And all of the contents of the container had spilled out all over the floor. And we were left with washing machines, dishwashers, fridges, just scattered along the deep sea floor. And it really was just a very, very sad sight, you know, our trash ending up in the deep sea. And it's really important that because our deep sea provides us with such important services that, as I said, keep us alive, we need to understand how we are impacting our deep sea. Um, and we need to remember that our ocean is so important to keeping our planet healthy. And because the deep sea is most of that, we really do need to try and keep our deep sea healthy as well. So because of this amazing diversity of habitats in the deep sea, it results in this amazing diversity of life. If it, ex if it exists in the shallow waters, it most likely exists in the deep sea, unless it breathes air, of course. But everything in the deep sea is just a little bit weirder. And as I like to say, a little bit more wonderful. You have things that really make you scratch your head because these animals have to cope with such extreme conditions, you know, that high pressure, those cool temperatures that we were talking about before, that it means that they have the really, really, really weird adaptations. So to wrap up, I'd like to tell you about my four favorite animals down in the deep ocean. So number four, this is, ooh, let's turn off the sound. Hope you can't hear that anymore. Um, so this is uh, a hydromedusae jelly, and we spotted this during the expedition in 2016 in the Mariana Trench. So this one is actually about four kilometers, it's over four kilometers depth, so about two and a half miles down in the deep sea. And this is a completely new species to science. Before this point, no one knew this species existed. And it's actually closely related to um, a Portuguese man of war. So it's not actually a, a true jelly. But, um, but it was really exciting for me because it was a completely new species. So number three, this little octopus has been nicknamed Casper the octopus for obvious reasons. I mean, it's white and kind of cute and has a kind of bulbous head like Casper does, Casper the ghost. Um, and this was discovered in 2016 off of Hawaii. Um, and again, this was found over three miles down in the deep sea. And again, this is a new species. And we know this is a new species because um, most octopus in the deep ocean have fins on the side of their head. And so we call those Dumbo octopus, and they're really, really cute. But this one, as you can see, doesn't have those fins. And for this one to be over three miles deep and not have fins is something that no one had ever seen before. And so it not only is a new species, 
but it actually actually might also be a new genus. So that's like the next category up that this that this octopus would fit into. So that makes it an even more important discovery. And also, it's the deepest record ever for a finless octopus. So again, that was a really special moment when this was found. And amazingly, both those two discoveries were found. And, and while they were found, they were being streamed live on the internet. So as the scientists were freaking out that these were new species and they were seeing them for the first time, you know, everybody who was watching at home was also part of that discovery. So then we've also got the Yeti crab. So some of you may have heard of this. And again, I have one sitting next to me in the lab. So those hydrothermal vents or those superheated sort of volcano type environments, that's where these Yeti crab live, Yeti crabs live, except mostly the species in off of Antarctica. And these crabs are blind. Um, they don't have any need for eyes in the deep sea because of the um, because there's no light. And they've got this really, really hairy chest and hairy arms, which you can see just on their underside. And we weren't really sure why they had that hairy chest, but when they were discovered in about 2010, I think, it turns out that these animals put themselves, they, they put their body into that warm bath water coming out of the superheated volcano. And that bacteria, which forms the basis of the food chain there, grows on those hairs on their chest and their arms. And so, and then the crabs just sort of use their hands to scoop the bacteria off of the hairs on their chest and arms and into their mouth. So it's like they have a grocery on their body. And I don't know about you guys, but that sounds pretty awesome to me. I would love to be able to just have food growing on my body. And then my favorite deep sea animal is the anglerfish. And I mean, you're gonna look at this and think, hey, that's really, really ugly. Why does she even like this? But it's because of the story behind it. So this anglerfish, this is one that was filmed for the first time, this species, this year. And all of these strings coming off of it are actually how to help the anglerfish find food. Because in the deep sea, it's really difficult to find anything um, because you know it's dark and it's such a big place that to find food is really difficult, to find a mate is really difficult. And so this anglerfish actually has all these strings coming off of it to help it sense any movements in the water. And that's what one of the special things about this. But what, but what I love about these anglerfish is actually how they find a mate. So this one you're seeing here in this picture is actually a lady anglerfish. And this, let's see if it'll work. This, if you can see my mouse hair hanging off the side of the anglerfish is actually the male. And so what happens is the male has really big eyes and really big nostrils. And he uses those to sniff out the females in the deep sea, again, because it's hard to find a mate, right? And so when he finds a female, he bites her. And when he bites her, it triggers this hormonal reaction in his body. And suddenly, all of his, all of his insides start to dissolve and his lips fuse to the side of her body. And before you know it, his blood, his blood system actually fuses with her blood system. And he stays there. That means that now he's fixed to that place for the rest of his life. And that is where that, that male will stay. And he actually just stays there, helping her to reproduce as she needs. And she gives him all the nutrients and oxygen and so on that he needs to stay alive. So they've evolved to have this really weird sort of symbiotic or really close relationship that benefits each other. And I just love that story because it's, you know, it's, it's this really weird thing, really weird adaptation. You know, there's no kinds of relationships like that on land. Um, but in the deep sea, this is something that's really, really normal. Very, very small males that are about, you know, less than 10 times the size of the female and then they fuse together to make sure that they can continue to create babies and not lose each other in the deep sea i just love that story so that's kind of me you get a bonus one this is again another one of my favorite animals but um it wasn't on the list but this is a long-nosed chimera and these are also called ratfish or rabbit fish or spook fish and they're actually really closely related to sharks and rays and again, this was seen in the Gulf of Mexico last year. And I just love them because I think they're super, super cute. Um, 
so yeah so that's about it really that's all from me um so i guess now oh let's stop sharing my screen have i stopped no almost there we go um so now uh i think i'm i'm ready to take questions oh but before i do let me show you so this if you can see yeah is actually one of the yeti crabs so this one is a really big male so they can sort of be about that size to this size which is like the size of my hand and so this is a really big male and if i tilt it a little bit you can just see i should have taken it out of the box all that dark stuff is actually the hair that it grows its bacteria on so these are just some really really weird crabs you don't get crabs like this on beaches and in shallow waters and that's why i love the deep sea so thanks for listening. Thank you so much. That was outstanding, Diva. All right, uh, you said <laughs> questions. Uh, we'll start with Miss McLaughlin's class. If you guys want to take us away. Hey, uh, hey go Brandon. How do they get touch pictures of the animals? How do they what? Get good pictures of all the animals. That's a great question. So as I said, it's the deep sea is a really hard place to work. We can't really go there like scuba diving or anything. So those really big pieces of equipment that I sent that I showed you guys, the ROV, the type of robot and the submersible, which is the one that we go in, they have so many cameras on them. And we don't send a piece of equipment down in the deep sea without cameras because we want to be able to capture as much information as possible. And those cameras take lots and lots of pictures and lots and lots of video, and then we bring them back onto the ship and we download all of, those, all of that video and imagery, pictures and so on, and then we spend months analyzing it to understand what it, were, what it is we saw in the deep sea. So that was a great question. All right, before we go to our second question, I just want to mention too, we've got some groups watching on YouTube Live. If you guys want to write in your questions in the chat bar, I can easily pass them along, just so you know. Uh, but for now, let's go to Aurelia and Harriet Todd Public School. You guys have a question, just come on up and uh, go for it. Why do we not discover more of the ocean? Why do we what? Why do we not discover more of the ocean? Again, another really good question, and I wish we did. Um, well, as I said, the deep sea, it's not a place that, you know, it's not like a forest where we can just walk on down and go and explore it. We can't breathe underwater, as you know, and so it means that we have to use really, really expensive pieces of equipment. And it means that we can't really spend a lot of time in the deep sea. And so that means that we just don't get to go down there to try and gather data and understand the deep sea as much as we'd like. But we're getting there slowly but surely. We've got people like you. So that's why. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's go to Ms. Burns' class if you guys have a question. Um, yeah. So... Casper the Octopus, um, mm -hmm. he's really cool, but that he won't found any trace of his mother or father because if he's that's if he's so amazing, then what happen then what happens when they grow up? What happens like do they get some sort of do they do they grow really big? Or do they stay small or? So again, another great question. Um, it's really amazing that you asked that because Casper actually has a really special way that it, that it mates. Um, so Casper will lay, after it's mated, it lays its eggs on this one, it'll, like a, something like a coral or a sponge grow, attached to the seafloor. It will lay its eggs along that. And then it sits and it covers up all of the eggs with its arms and will stay there until the eggs hatch. And we have no idea how long that takes, but some deep sea octopus, not Casper, but another one that's purple and lives off California, actually has been found to live with its eggs for five, nearly five years, four and a half years. And so think about like when your mom was pregnant with you, she was pregnant for nine months. But some of these deep sea octopuses actually are pregnant or stay with their eggs for 53 months. That's crazy, crazy long. Um, but we don't know, you know, we know that they hatch as babies and that the mothers stay with them until they hatch. But then after that, we don't really know much more about them. That one time, we've only seen that species of octopus two or three times, and we actually haven't been able to collect any. So it means that we have a lot more questions to answer. 
It really is a great question. We get a lot of researchers talking about their animals, even some mm-hmm. of the biggest animals in the world, whales, whale sharks. We don't understand everything about their life cycle. Which is yep. so cool. The oceans. We need more marine biologists, guys. We need more marine biologists to help us answer these questions. All right. Let's head to Mr. England's class. If you guys want to demute your mic, uh, you'll be good to go. Take your time. No hurry. Just a little microphone symbol top of your screen for Mr. England. And then so you got the one. Yeah. You should, you should be good. We've got your camera on one and your audio on another for some reason. That's okay. I've got all kinds of things <laughs> up here, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're good to go. Do you want to ask? Hello, my name is Aiden. And how many types of deep sea cephalopods have you found? Wow. Okay, hi, Aiden. I'm amazed that you even know what a cephalopod is. That's amazing. Um, I... So I have not, so that, okay, there's lots of different ways to answer that question, but I've been on loads of expeditions where we've seen deep sea octopuses or squids or um, other types of cephalopods. And sometimes none of, some of those are species that we know about. And sometimes those are species that we've never seen before, but we have seen a lot of them. But the thing about, you know, seeing something as a new species to be a hundred percent sure we actually need to collect it. And then we need to study it in really big, in really fine detail. Like, and, but octopuses and cephalopods are really, really hard to catch. So it means that, you know, working on cephalopods, working on squids, working on octopuses is actually really, really difficult um, because we can't really catch them. And so that means that we know even less about them than we do a lot of other groups of animals. But, I mean, we tend to see them on nearly every expedition I go on. And one of my personal favorites is the Dumbo octopuses that have the fins on their heads. They're great. Cool. All right. I know the class changed over halfway through, but let's go to Virginia Beach. If you guys have a question, um, Mr. Okay. Reno's group. So, right. uh, so, uh, here is my question. Which discovery surprised you the most? Which discovery did what? Surprised you the most. Surprised me the most. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, you know, as I was saying, probably one of the most, oh, oh, this is a hard one. There have just been so many things about the deep sea that we don't know. So actually I was working in this part of the Pacific um, in 2013 and 2015. Um, which is called the Clarion Clipton Zone, and it's between Hawaii and California. And we did some work out there for two months. And we, actually, what was incredible about that part of the ocean is before we went there, no one had ever been there. But over 50% of all the animals that we collected were completely new to science. No one had ever seen them before. And we're talking about everything from brittle stars, to corals, to sponges, to anemones, everything, or at least half of everything that we found was new. And that may sound really amazing, and it, and it was, you know, those kinds of numbers are really extraordinary. But in the deep sea, on nearly every single expedition I go on, we find something new to science, because that's how little we know about the deep ocean. Cool. All right, let's go to Miss Bradbury's group in Halifax. They joined us halfway through. Uh, you just have need to demute your own mic, guys. So come on up to the front and uh, and go for it. And wants to work. There we go. You're good. Okay. Come on. Come on. <laughs> come. Okay. One at a time. Okay. Okay. Be careful, boys. Um, why do you like the? They're called yeti crabs, right? Yeah. Yeti crab, yeah. yeah. Why do the yeti crabs eat like the yeah. bacteria on their fur? So I guess they eat the bacteria off their fur because, as I said, in the deep sea, it's really hard to get food because there's so little of it coming from the uh. sea surface. And so if you could essentially grow your own food on your body and where they live, there's this really plentiful supply of this chemicals that the bacteria then use to grow. Why would you not eat it? I don't. Eat, I don't maybe it tastes good too, but <laughs> but I think it's more about ease. You know, in the deep sea, it's it's really hard to get food, and and that means a lot of things move really slowly, grow really slowly, reproduce really slowly. 
And so they, animals try to conserve their energy in the deep ocean. So if they could just grow on their body and be really kind of lazy, I guess they, they, that's easier, right? Perfect. Uh, Diva, so we've done one question from each class. Do you have time for six more questions? Or yeah, you... for sure. Let's do it. <laughs> might need to go and that's fine if you guys need to drop out that's totally fine we're going to start from the top and work our way through one by one so we'll start with this mclaughlin's class again if you guys have a second question we'll come on up where does like all the money and funding come from for the dtf that is another really great question you guys are on it man um so a lot of the funding from deep, for deep sea stuff comes from uh like governments so the u.s government for instance funds a lot of deep sea research as does the, the canadian government um but a lot of a lot of countries can't afford to do deep, deep sea research because it's so expensive and so when that happens there are actually some really really rich people like the founder of Microsoft, one of the founders of Microsoft, who actually passed away last night, um, as well as, you know, one of the founders of Google. And there are lots of other really, really rich people that have decided that a good way to spend their money is by paying for research, paying for us to be able to understand more about our oceans, because only by understanding more about our oceans can we really, you know, take care of it better, right? So governments, um, really rich people, and also uh, actually now companies also are starting to fund marine research um, quite a lot as well. So yeah, a mixture really. It's really interesting. For We've been doing these for over three years, and it's only been the last month and a half that we're getting all these questions about funding. I don't know what it is, but it's been It's really great. <laughs> um, all right, let's go back to Harriet Todd. Uh, if you guys have a second question. Have you ever been in the Mariana Trench? And if so, what types of creatures did you see there? So I have been in the Mariana Trench. And if anybody doesn't know, the Mariana Trench is actually where the deepest point on our planet is. So the deepest part of the Mariana Trench is called Challenger Deep. And that's just about 11 kilometers depth. So that's probably about like eight miles or so, seven miles. Um, and yes, I went there in 2016 um, with one of those robots that we send down into the deep sea. And we, you know, I thought before I went there that it's this trench and everything would be very similar in the trench. You know, it'd be a lot of, a lot of sediment, a lot of like steep walls um, and a lot of the same animals. But that is actually not at all what we found in the Marianne Trench and surrounding it there were just a huge variety of different types of animals. We found everything, you know, corals, starfish, sea urchins, um, sea cucumbers, sponges. I mean, any most of the deep sea environments that I was talking about today, apart from whale falls, we found in the Mariana Trench. And that, and that was just such a surprise, you know, this such a variety of different habitats in this one place which actually is pretty big and has a big depth gradient because it's got you know from 200 meters all the way down to about um, the deepest point on the planet it means that we've got loads of different types of environments and I guess that's why you get such a huge variety of different animals and it was really cool that was where that jelly was found that you guys I showed you guys a little while ago that new species and actually a lot of the animals we found on that expedition were again new species we'd never seen before and that was pretty special just a really quick follow-up question can you tell the class how many people have been to the very bottom of the Mariana Trench yeah so actually it's it's amazing because more people have been to the moon than they have to the deepest point on our planet about I'm not sure how many people have been to the moon probably 20 something 12 12, there you go, there you go. That's why Jess is here, guys. <laughs> so 12 people have been to the moon and only three people have ever been to the bottom of our ocean, the deepest point on our ocean. Um, and yeah, three, three men, two in about the 1960s and one a couple of years ago. So, we're, and currently there is no um, submarine, submersible type vehicle that we can use to get down there because the only one we had that was able to take people that far down actually got destroyed in an accident. So, yeah, yeah. So it means that um, 
yeah, we uh, we currently have no way of getting down there. Um, and so we got to get some more, you know, funding so that then we can get another one to take people down there. <laughs> I mean, would you want to go down there? I would. That one guy, by the way, for the classes is the director of Avatar, James Cameron, which is kind of an mm -hmm. unexpected turn of events, but he's a... Yeah. All right, let's go to Miss Burns' class again. Do you guys have a second question? Go for it. Yeah. So um, about the chemicals that volcano underwater things, mm -hmm. did you get a chance to capture a sample and research it? And if so, are the chemicals familiar to you or are they something new? Yeah, so we, so this is actually something, those hydrothermal vents have been, that was a great question, have, were discovered in about the 1970s, 1977 actually. And so for the last 40 or so years, scientists have actually been really, really intrigued and done a lot of work on these hydrothermal vents. And so yes, they have taken lots of these samples. And amazingly, because the water coming out of them, the fluid is so hot, they have to, the only way they can sample them, because they can be like 400 degrees Celsius. That's how hot we're talking about. And that would melt most things. So they actually have to collect those samples using a titanium syringe, because that's one of the few things that won't melt. But when they did collect them, what they found is that actually in that, in that fluid is a lot of metals. So things like gold, silver, copper, iron, um, a lot of particles of the metals, and also a lot of chemicals like um, hydrogen sulfide. So, you know, when you smell a rotten egg um, and it smells really funky, that's hydrogen sulfide. And so a lot of hydrogen sulfide um, has been found in those and a lot of methane, which is a type of, um, which is used as fuel sometimes. Um, so, so lots of chemicals that we, I mean, all of the chemicals we came across we knew about, we just didn't know that they came out of the earth in that way, and then that they were used by animals to make energy. Yeah. Cool. These are great questions today. Um, they I'll really are. More than uh, let's go to Mr. England's class. If you guys want to go, uh, just demute you your mic, and you're good to go. OK. Um, hi, my name is Hadley. Um, my question is, when, how old were you when you decided that this is one what you wanted to do and when you took your first dive? Oh, great question. Um, so as I said, I grew up in the Caribbean and so I kind of always liked being around the ocean, but I actually wanted to be a doctor for a long time. Um, but my parents said they didn't think that was a really good choice. Um, and they wanted me to do something that I really loved, um, which I'm really glad they, they insisted on because I love what I do. Um, so I think I decided I wanted to do marine science when I was about 17, um, even though I really, really liked it before and I really liked nature and I really liked the ocean. Um, and then I decided to do deep sea stuff when I was probably about like 21, but that's just because until that point, I didn't know anything about the deep sea. Um, I had never come across it in my life. And so it just, it wasn't something that was really familiar to me. Um, but, oh, I was going to say something else about that. The question was, when did I find out? Oh, when did I pick, take my first dive? So I actually started scuba diving, which is, you know, shallow water on coral reefs, um, when I was, I think, 15. And I highly recommend that. If you get the chance to go scuba diving, it is really incredible just being down there surrounded by um, all of these amazing animals and, you know, weightless almost. That's really, that's really special. But I actually got to do my first deep dive in a submersible um, probably when I was about 25. Um, and I went down to about, how deep did I go? Probably about one and a half miles in the Cayman Trench, which is in the Caribbean. Um, and that was, that was also amazing. I mean, when you're going down, you're just seeing things that you've never seen before. It's like fireworks because of all the bioluminescence outside the window. Um, it just... While it is very scary at first and a little stressful because you have lots of things to do because you're only down there for a certain amount of period, a certain amount of time, you're only usually down there for about seven or eight hours. And everybody else on the ship has given you this shopping list of things, tasks and things that you need to collect from the deep sea for them. And so it means that you have a lot of things to get through. So before you know it, that eight hours in that submersible is over and you're back at the surface. But it's really, it's really a really cool job. Uh, just for the classes note too, I think every class is grade five and above. And once you're grade five, so once you're 10 years old, you can actually start on the path of being a scuba diver. So 
If you want to look it. It up in your community, uh, I highly recommend it. I just signed up myself two weeks ago. Yay! <laughs> We have time for two more questions, really rapid fire. So let's go first to Virginia Beach. If you guys have a second one, uh, want to come up, go right ahead. If you don't, that's fine too. Someone's excited. You just have to demute your mic, and then you're good. And it wants to work. Call her. Uh, yeah, so you still got to demute your mic, guys. Sorry about that. Just microphone symbol top of your screen, and then you'll be good. I'll let you know. I can see you. Yeah, we can see that. <laughs> we can do step up four questions, you know? Yeah. There we go. Good. Oh, yeah, we're off. Good. What's the most exotic place you've traveled to for a discovery? Ooh. So, was that question, what's the most exotic place I've traveled to? Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, I forgot to say, but that's one of the coolest things about this job. Apart from the fact that you get to go to places where no one's been before, like the deep sea, you get to travel to really exciting places. So, I mean, I've been to Antarctica. Um, I've been to the Mariana Trench and to get there, we went to Guam and Saipan, which is in the par part of the Commonwealth of the Mariana Islands. I'd never even heard of that before that expedition. Um, where else have we been to? Lots of places in the Caribbean, lots of places in the US. Um, the tippy tip of South America, which is where we left from to go to South, to go to Antarctica. Um, been all over Europe, been to Asia. I mean, literally, you do get to go everywhere for your work. And that's really cool. Like next year, I'm going on an expedition from the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. Um, and I've never been there. And so it, it really does give you an, an amazing opportunity to travel and see new environments and also meet, you know, experience cultures that you probably wouldn't get to experience normally. Awesome. All right, Miss Bradbury's group, let's wrap it up. One more question, come on up and uh, go for it. Okay. Um, how many animals have you discovered in the deep sea? Oh, good question. Um, so two ways to answer that question. So discovered is kind of hard because we don't really say, like we can, in order to say you've really, really, really discovered something, you need to give it a new name, right? And so to give it a new name, that means you have to have a, one of them in, like, in your hand, in your lab, so you can do that work on them. So you don't always, as I was saying, it's really hard to like catch octopuses and other things, so you don't always get a sample. So ones that I've actually given a name, I've given three worm they're bone eating worms they live only on the skeletons of whales in the deep sea pretty special they're called osidax so i've discovered three of those and a new species of lobster and i'm currently working on a new species of coral but those are just ones that i've given names to i've been on expeditions with other scientists where we've found literally hundreds of new species and again, that's just how it is working in the deep sea. So if you want to see new things, you want to see cool things, definitely yeah. consider becoming a deep sea scientist. Great, Thank you so Great question. Much. All right, uh, Diva, you may want to turn down your volume for you, uh, just because at the end of every hangout, what we do is we're going to demute every class's mic. Uh, so Miss uh, Virginia Beach, Miss McLaughlin's class, uh, Harriet Todd, Mr. England's class, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you to Diva for joining us today. So thank you so, so much, Diva. Uh, to the classes, we've got many more hangouts the rest of the month. Uh, November is our space month, so please join us for that. Diva, that was outstanding, and we look Let's forward to having you. Thank you for having us.